Good, Good morning. The four living creatures and the sealed scroll. Now, we're not going to get into what the sealed scroll is right away. So if you haven't come up with what it is, you got about another 20 minutes to figure it out. All right. So this week, for this week, we're going to look at Revelation 6. That'll be for next week. Next week's assignment is read Revelation 6, and we're going to talk about the first seal. We're getting into the seal judgments. The seal judgments play a big part in today's lesson, as you will see. I almost created an illustration, uh, a hands-on illustration. I just didn't have the time, so you guys are going to have to use your... When we get to the sealed scroll, you're actually going to have to use your imagination. So, Revelation 4. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. And before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. Remember, we talked about those that are in Isaiah. The seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal... And around the throne, on each side of the throne, were four living creatures. On each side of the throne are four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature is like a lion. The second living creature is like an ox. The third living creature was the face of a man. And the fourth living creature is like that of an eagle in flight. So we know uh, that the book of Revelation has 800 allusions to the Old Testament. And this is yet another one. And it doesn't just uh, give us a glimpse back towards Ezekiel 1.5 or Ezekiel 1. It gives us a glimpse actually even further back. And that's what we're going to look at mostly. But the, the specific reference in Ezekiel is from the midst of it came a li the likeness of four living creatures. Remember, this is the vision of Ezekiel, the wheel within a wheel. And for the likeness of their faces, each had a human face. And the four had the face of a lion on the right side, face the face of an ox on the left side, and then the four had a face of an eagle. So there we are again. There's the same thing. Sorry. That's all right. So to really get an idea, anybody have a clue what these are? Besides their their angels, maybe or whatever. Anybody? Okay. Believe it or not. You know how we know who these are? The book of Numbers. That book, you know, that you hate to read when you're doing your yearly reading plan because it's got a lot of numbers in it. Let me tell you something. The Pentateuch, those five, verse, those five first books, when you get a sense of exactly what they're telling you and you look at the fact that they are a shadow of things to come and the body is of Christ, that's what Colossians says. When you get that idea... That this is all talking about Jesus. You're going to be fascinated to read those first five books. So the book of Numbers. In the book of Numbers, in the first and second chapter, we're given a census of men of fighting age. What's the fighting age? Anybody remember what the fighting age is? You, you couldn't fight any at any younger age than this, and, and once you got to this age, you were, had to be retired. Anybody remember the ages? 20. And at 50, you're done. So when we look at the census in Numbers 1 and Numbers 2, what we're seeing is a, um, a number representing 20-year-olds to 50-year-old men who could fight. So... You have to realize that a lot of these guys are married, they have kids, there's older people, there's younger people. So these numbers that are in the book of Numbers are just a snapshot of, and we, and we could illustrate it here. If you are a man, and you're between the age of 20 and 50, raise your hand. You're not a man. 20 and 50, you're older than 50? Okay, so you can't... Just a little bit. Okay. If you're, if you're between 20 and 50, if you're between 20 and 50, raise your hand high. 20 and 50. So, one, two, three, four. There's, there's five of us. Six of us, Lance. There's six of us out of this whole class. So that gives you an idea of the numbers we're talking about. Okay. So even though we have represented, you know, several hundred thousand people in the census, it's actually millions of people. 
So we're also told the layout of the camp. We're told the groups by which they're laid out. Because see, Israel, when the camp is laid out, Israel is to lay out in three groups, I mean in four groups of three. And then of those four groups, one tribe is chosen to lead the other two tribes in, you know, with it. So in Judah, they're told in Numbers 2-3 to camp. They camp east towards the sunrise. Now, Judah has with them Issachar and Zebulun. And they total 186,000 fighting men. And again, these notes are going to be on the website. So, you know, I've got to breeze through this. Reuben, they're on the south side of the camp. They have Simeon and Gad with them, and they take 151,450 fighting men. Ephraim, they're on the west side. They have Manasseh and Benjamin. Now, remember, Ephraim and, and Manasseh are brothers. From who? Joseph. Okay, and they got Benjamin, who is also the youngest son. Joseph and Benjamin from the same mother. They have 108,000. Then on the north side, we have Dan. They have Asher and Nephtali, and they have 157,600. Who was in the middle of the camp? The Levites. Did they have an inheritance? No, they do not have an inheritance. Uh, what's interesting, though, is, is that in Millennial Kingdom, they do. All right? That tells you something's changed. Those people who poo-poo dispensationalism say it's all the same, you know, there is no dispensation of grace in it. All you got to do is just look at, the, at Levites. They're treated differently. They're treated differently in, in Revelation 7 when we get the 144,000. They're listed, but so are Judah. They're all priests. And that's, that's for another time. So they have 22,300, and they're broken up into different uh, camps themselves that were sons of Levi. Then they have different administrations. Some of them carry the stuff. Some of them set it up. Some of them do the actual sacrificing. They had different jobs. Now, the camps were set in four cardinal directions, around the tabernacle and the Levites. So... They were set to the east, south, west, and north of this camp. And I've got an illustration of this. I'm going to show it to you. But what they didn't do, because Jews are real good about obeying the rules back then, right? That, so if, if the Lord told you to camp south of the Levites, did you camp southeast of the Levites too? Did you camp southwest? No. So they're on the four cardinal directions, but they're not on the offshoots. You're not camping southeast, southwest, northwest, or northeast. So we have this picture that, matter of fact, it's the next slide. Here's the aerial view of the camp. Okay? The Levites are in the middle. So we're going to have cardinal directions. We're gonna, they're going to camp in long lines. Now, what we're going to do here is I, I gave you those numbers. Before you read before today, unless you knew this, you probably just thought those were numbers. Oh, this is a number. It doesn't mean anything. Well, it does. It does. Everything in the Word of God means something. And if you come across something, as I always tell you, if you come across something that seems like it's odd or out of place or this, why is it? You need to dig because there's your treasure. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the fighting men and we're going to proportionalize they're, how much space, because you're not going to take 108,000 and 187,000 and stick them in the same spot, right? The 187,000 group is going to have to take up more area than the 108,000. You'll see this. So who's to the east? Who's camping towards the sunrise? Judah. They're camping towards the east. To the south is Reuben. And here's your numbers, okay? To the north, I'm sorry, to the, uh, to the west is Ephraim. And to the north is Dan. Is that the cross? That's the cross. <coughs> so, this should give you goosebumps. It gives me, I, I'm, every time I, I, I think of this. If you were to fly over back in the day, 
the camp of Israel from the air, what you would have seen is the cross moving across the desert. That's the cross. And that's proportional. Everything means something, guys. You just got to dig. So, looking at an aerial view of the camp, in the middle, we have the Levites. They represent holiness. That was their, that's what they are. They're representing the tabernacle of God, protecting the holiness of God. That's where the tabernacle was. That's where God's presence was. Well, on the east side, we have Judah, the lion. And that represents the book of Matthew. Because the lion is the king. And the book of Matthew is all about Jesus the king. On the south side, Reuben. Well, he's represented, and we see the verses here, he's representative as a man. Okay? Uh, and that represents the book of Luke. Because Luke portrays Jesus as a man. On the west side, we have Ephraim. He's the ox. And, and there we have the scriptures. What is an ox? An ox is a beast of burden. He's a servant. So Ephraim's camp represents the book of Mark, which portrays Jesus as a servant. And finally, we have Dan which was, their representation was the eagle. Now, before the Exodus, they were called a serpent. If you go back into Genesis 49, if you look at, at even what Moses said when he was giving his blessings and, and uh, when Jacob was giving his blessings, he called Dan a serpent. But when they got into the promised land, uh, Eliezer, after the Exodus, changed it to the eagle. They're like, we're no longer a serpent. We're going to be the eagle. So, here we go. We have a lion, a man, an ox, and an eagle. These are the four beasts surrounding the tabernacle. Isn't that what we just read in Revelation 4? It's the same thing. Because... The camp of Israel is a picture of heaven. It's a picture of the throne of God, the holiness of God. And the camp of Israel, all of these people are here because they are what? What are they doing for the Levites here? Protecting them. And what we find out as we read Revelation 4 that uh, represents the throne room, and then we have a lion, man, ox, and eagle, that these are the cherubim. The cherubim are those special class of angels whose job it is to protect the holiness of God. Those are seraphims. Cherubims are the ones that are protecting the holiness of God. All right? And seraphim and cherubim are sometimes used interchangeably. Um, now, here's the important thing. Why Jesus? Why do we need Jesus? Let's think about it in terms of what we're reading now. Why do you need Jesus Christ and, and His sacrifice and atonement for your sin to get, gain interest to God? To go to heaven, but in, 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 in context of what we just learned, why do you need Jesus? You're, you're thinking surface. Go deep. Go deep, deep, deep. Why do we need Jesus? In context of what we just learned about the four living creatures around the throne of God, the camp of Israel protecting the holiness of God, say it. They won't let us in. You, you, if you want to get to the throne of God, apart from Jesus, you've got to fight four cherubim. You cannot gain access to God. You cannot approach God because the cherubim who protect God's holiness will not allow it. And you, apart from the blood of Christ, are unholy. So that's the holiness in the middle of your uh, illustration? Exactly. The, Levi. the Levites represent the holiness. They represent the tabernacle where the holiness of God dwells. Yeah. Similar to the curtain, you couldn't get to the holiness. Exactly. 
Exactly. And that's what Jesus did. What did Jesus do to that curtain? And, you know, we think of that curtain. When we think of that curtain, we think of maybe a big curtain in, in a hall. No. This thing was huge and thick. When that thing fell, it thundered. And the very fact that it could have ripped is impossible man, in, in man's eye. Because it was like three inches thick. It was How they hung it, I have no idea. And down with the... Yeah. So, that is the point. That's right. So, Ezekiel 28, 16. Who is the head, who was the head cherubim? In the beginning? In the beginning. Lucifer. Lucifer. Those four angels that are protecting the holiness of God right now, and were protecting it back in the day when, when Ezekiel saw the vision, their boss used to be Satan. Because it says, I destroyed you, O guardian cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. This is a fascinating look in Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14 at, at who Satan is. And we're going to look at it a little bit when we talk about the Antichrist. But he was the guardian cherub. He was, he was the head guy. He was in charge of protecting the holiness of God. He was these four cherubs' bosses. And he got jealous. He was the cherub of the covering. Yeah, he was the protecting cherub. Yeah. Okay? And he was in the midst of the stones of fire, which are the cherub among themselves. So, that brings us to the sealed scroll. Anybody, first of all, got a guess on what the sealed scroll is? What does it represent? Nope. So, I saw on the right hand of him who was seated on the throne, a scroll written, and on the back sealed with seven seals. Now, what we need to understand here, uh, you know what? Don't do that yet. I'll, I'll next slide. No one in heaven or earth is found worthy to open it. Ah, but then in verse 5, one is found. The Lion of Judah. Worthy are you to take the scroll and open its seals. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe, language, people, and nation. So, what's the sealed scroll? What is that that, that Jesus is worthy of, of taking and opening? What is it? Hmm? Nope. Good guess, but that's not it. So we have to read... To understand what we're looking at here, we have to read this real obscure passage in Jeremiah. Jeremiah 52, verse 5 through 14. I'm not going to read it all. I'm going to summarize it here. 32. Jeremiah 32, verse 5 through... I'm sorry. Jeremiah 32, verse 5 through 14. So Jeremiah is told to go buy my field that is in Ananoth, for the right of redemption by the purchase is yours. Then he, Jeremiah says, I signed the deed, sealed it, got witnesses, and weighed the money on the scales. So he sealed this deed. Then he says, I took the sealed deed of purchase containing the terms and the conditions and the open copy. And then he took this sealed deed of purchase, this open deed, and put it in an earthenware vessel that it may last a long time. Shut the, if you know it, you got to wait now. You had your chance. <laughs> Got a little bit out of it. Okay. So, remember this. Jeremiah is going into exile. When he writes Jeremiah, he's still in Jerusalem. He hasn't gone into exile yet. He's eventually going to go to Egypt, and then he's going into exile. He, he, uh, he's not doing this for himself. What he's doing is he's burying it so that whenever they returned, he knew that they were going to return. That whoever came back to that land, they would be able to unbury that jar and take the title of the land back. The sealed scroll in Revelation represents the title deed to the earth. Okay? Because this is how they did this back in the day. This title deeds were written. They'd have a, a, pick, a, a part of it written. They would roll it up a little bit. They would seal it. 
They would roll it, write some more, roll it a little bit more, seal it again. Roll it, seal it. Roll it, seal it. And they did that seven times. So that finally on the outside of the seal, that's when the final seal was there. But if you open the scroll, you had to open seven seals, but not like seven seals across the top of the scroll, like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It was one, two, you ever get what I'm saying here? That's what the title deeds, that's how they did title deeds back then. What this seal scroll is, is the title deed to the earth. Now, the title deed to the earth, we have to remember, was originally given to Adam. But it was taken back when he sinned. And it's a very interesting little passage in Luke 4. When Satan says to him, to you, to Jesus, I will give you all this authority and their glory. In other words, he's talking about the land, all the kingdoms of the earth. I'm going to give you all of this. And he tells the truth here. For it has been delivered to me. It was delivered to him when Adam sinned. He, Satan, got the title deed to the earth. That is the reason why no one was found worthy to open it except for Jesus. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbeliever. Remember, Satan is the God of this world. He, can, he, he has the title deed right now to the earth. It's not until Revelation 5 when Jesus start, in Revelation 6, when Jesus starts to unseal the scroll, that he actually takes the title deed of the earth back. So the first Adam lost it. The second Adam gets it. Jesus is the redeemer of the title deed. And now we're going to see why you had to read the book of Ruth. Because we're going to talk about the kinsman redeemer. The book of Ruth is not just the story of Naomi and Ruth and Boaz. It's not. The book of Ruth is an illustration of Jesus Christ. Because in the book of Ruth, we see this process. We got a young woman that was widowed, and we see this in Leviticus. Uh, it was up to the male members of the family to raise up children to redeem him. To redeem, the, the, if, if they died without issue, it was up to other male members to marry his bride to redeem his name so that his name would not be lost in the land of Israel. Hereditary titles are extremely important. All throughout the Old Testament and even to today. So, Boaz, Boaz is the Goel. That is the name in Hebrews, the Goel. He is the kinsman redeemer. So, as the kinsman redeemer, the Goel had to, first of all, he had to be a kinsman. You could not be a redeemer unless you were kin. You couldn't redeem this, this person's land, this person's inheritance, this person's title. You couldn't redeem love, uh, to raise up children in their name unless you were a blood kin, blood relative. Steps didn't do it. In-laws didn't do it. You had to be blood. You had to be able you had to be able to do it. So we see Boaz was of the clan of Elimelech in Ruth 2.3. So yes, he was a kinsman because he's of that clan. He had to be able. So the man is a close relative of ours, one of our Redeemer. That is what uh, Naomi is told by Ruth. He, 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 he's one of those guys. He's, he's able to redeem us. Had to be willing. Here's the thing. If you were not willing to do it, no one could make you do it. They found a closer Redeemer. But the Redeemer said, no. He said, I'll do it. And then when he found out he had to take a wife, he's like, no, that's going to mess everything up. That, that really is, you know, yeah, I'll take the land. That's cool. I'll redeem the land. But when he found out he's going to have to take a bride, he said, no, I cannot redeem it. For, my, for myself, at least I impair my own inheritance. Because what he was afraid of was he already had kids. If he had kids with this lady, then now they're going to fight for the inheritance. His kids are going to be all mad. We're not going to go there, is what he said. Take, and then he says to Boaz, take my right of redemption yourself, for I cannot redeem it. And then 
it says here in Ruth 4 9, you are my witnesses this day that I have brought from the hand of Naomi all that belong to Elimelech and all that belong to Kylon and Nahalon. Remember, these are the sons that also died. All right? Uh, they died and they couldn't. Can you turn get that air? They died and never had kids. So, the Goel also had to assume all the obligations of its beneficiary. So, we, we, we think about it. They had to be of the kinsmen. They had to be able to do it. They had to want to do it. And then when they did it, they had to assume all the obligations of who they were doing it for. And that's what we see. Boaz says, I'm going to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brothers and from the gate of his native place. So Boaz is saying, hey, I'm willing and able and I'll take on every responsibility, and I can do it. So, how this relates to Jesus, and how this relates to the sealed scrolls, because in order to take that land, to take that title deed, you have to be a goel. In order to redeem the land, you have to be a kinsman redeemer. Everybody following me? Okay. Enter Jesus, the king. He is the ultimate kinsman redeemer. He is the ultimate goel. He had to be a kinsman. Jesus was man. You want to know why it's such a heresy to say that Jesus was just a spirit? Which is what some of the Gnostics would say. They couldn't say he was a man. Because you cannot, unless you're a man, flesh and blood, you cannot redeem the earth. You, because then all of this stuff that is pictures and illustrations of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament, it all falls to pieces. And there's a reason for it. So he had to be a, a kinsman. He had to be able. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin. See, he knew no sin. He's able. So that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Next, he had to be willing. Jesus said in John 10, 18, he goes, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down. If that's not willing, I don't know what is. He laid it down willingly. That's, a re that's the error of the medieval Catholic Church and even the Catholic Church of, of the modern, some early modern times, uh, back in the 16th, 17th, 18th century in those times, where they blamed the Jews for killing Christ, and so therefore they're disinherited and the, the, everything's annulled? No! No one killed Jesus. Jesus laid his life down. Amen. Satan wasn't lying when he came to him in the wilderness and said, you know, I'll take you to the temple, the top of the temple, and you can drop down and, and basically declare Malachi, because Malachi had prophesied that this one, I will, the Lord will appear suddenly in his temple. And he wanted Jesus to fulfill that early with them. To forego the cross. But no one took his life. Jews didn't take his life. Romans didn't take his life. You didn't take his life. He gave his life for you. Had to be willing. Had to assume all of the obligations of the beneficiary. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds you have been healed. See, he took on willingly all of those obligations that you had. All your obligations, the curse of sin, he took it on. So, that is the reason for the book of Ruth. The book of Ruth is not just a fun story, a, 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 a cool, it is. It is a great story to read. It's very uplifting and, and it's very loving. But it's a picture of Christ. It's a picture of Christ, the kinsman redeemer. And that's what Revelation 4 and Revelation 5 is all about. The holiness of God, the wickedness of man, needing to be redeemed. The earth is captured by the devil. He holds the title deed to the earth. But we have a kinsman redeemer that redeemed not only to the earth, but you. Everybody tracking with me? Everybody getting it? Okay. So, we're actually going to finish up a little early and we have some time to talk about this.
I want to point out that prior to Revelation 5.5, 5, Jesus is always symbolized in Gentile terms. Okay? You will never see a Jewish Jesus prior to Revelation 5.5. 5. You always see him talking to Gentile churches. He's, he, he's in Gentile terms. But after Revelation 5.5, 5, he's always symbolized in Jewish terms. Revelation 5, 5. Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah. The root of David. He has conquered so that he has opened the, been able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Revelation 5, 6. I saw a lamb. That's Jewish. Because the Passover lamb. He's the Passover lamb. I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain. That is a picture of what the Jews would do. Sacrifice for sin. So something changes after John was caught up in Revelation 4.2. The whole tenor of the book changes. Everything about Revelation all of a sudden changes. We're catapulted into the throne room of God in Revelation 4. And now around the throne is the Goel, the Redeemer, who's able to take this sealed scroll and that's what we'll be looking at next week, and start breaking these seals. And now, everything that is said about him is Jewish in, in orientation. It's Jewish in imagery that Jews can understand. It's, it's Jewish in the fact that now they can see that, oh, this is not the Gentile God. Because see, right now, most Jews will believe that Jesus is a Gentile creation. He's not the Messiah. He's a creation of the Gentile mind. He's their God, not our God. But after this, after Revelation 5.5, 5, He is now portrayed as the Jewish Messiah. So, let's discuss it. What are your questions? Stunned silence. First of all, what do you think about the cross moving across the desert? That's close. That's very close. You know, it wasn't Moses' intention when he wrote the book of Numbers to portray a cross. It wasn't his purpose in writing that, but it was God's purpose. God's amazing. The same God that formed Israel up in the shape of a cross. It's the same God that's going to go with David and Paul to Bulgaria. So, what else? What are your questions? I know y'all have some. Well, to me, it reinforces the inheritance. You know, I think of uh, Matthew, uh, the lineage. Christ is very detailed and how that how that tree or that right. theology, if you will, that is made perfect. Right. So all this inheritance can happen. Right. And the same in Luke. Yeah. The same in Luke. Exactly right. Because he is the Goel. He had to be a kinsman to do what he did. He couldn't have just come and just wiped it clean as a spirit or you know a ghost. The Holy Ghost couldn't have done it. He had to take on flesh and blood. Because in order to redeem something, according to, and this is Levitical law. This is not just in the book of Ruth. This goes back to the law. You know, we see in Leviticus 25, you had to be a kinsman. Someone of the man's family. Well, we're all family. Right? I mean... You know, we've talked about this, uh, some, some of us have talked about it, you know, and David and I especially have talked about it because we're, we're related very distantly, but we are. Um, we, yeah, like, like seventh cousins twice removed or something like that. So, um, yeah, our, we share a common, like, eighth great-grandfather. All right, so that's, but here's the thing. When you go back, and do some, if you do genealogy, what you'll realize is that 
once you get to uh, your fifth or sixth great grandfather, grandparents, you're talking about 8,000 sets of grandparents. The chances of me sharing a one grandparent, whether it's the granddad or the grandmother, that's the eighth or the tenth, or you even go back to the, the, the 15th, you're looking at a million. Odds are that we're a lot closer related, every one of us are a lot closer related than no. It's just, it's just the way it is. Because I guarantee you, you've got somebody back in your history that was a, a praetor who was my great-great-grandfather. And, and that praetor and my praetor join up maybe back in the 1600s. So we're all related. Um, and that's, that's in importance. Because see, as David pointed out, the genealogy is is very important to establish who he is. That he is a man. That he comes from Adam. Just like you came from Adam. So that's very important. I, I would choose uh, working on the genealogy right now of the different tribes that are scattered and really high everywhere. They are. And there's a lot of interesting ideas about where the 12 tribes are. They are actually mentioned in Revelation 7. They got cursed. What happened? What What did Dan do? Hmm? What did they do? They built an altar. Oh, shame on them. Yeah. Yeah. And they got replaced. But they're back. In Revelation, they're back. Uh, it was uh, you had to ask me that. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, it was. Uh, it was one. It, I think it was. Uh, yeah, I think it was Manassas. So, what else? We got about. We got about three or four minutes. <laughs> Anything else? What do y'all think about what? If it, what do you think about your kinsman redeemer? I had a thought. You know, we have some neighbors that are. Uh, they said they had Cherokee relatives, right? You know, so they had to go to the Cherokee Nation in Oklahoma to prove that their lineage, if they were tied to, I don't know how they do it, whether they do some kind of genealogy search. The Elizabeth Warren, maybe. But anyway, that made them. I gotta understand politics to know that. It made them uh, eligible for some land in Oklahoma or something like that, you know. So it, it kind of ties in because of that lineage. They were right. They got part of that land. So my my sixth great grandmother was Cherokee, and your my great grandmother is part Cherokee. Your great grandmother was half. So I mean, Cherokee and very cut. Uh, That's what each parent though. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, part Cherokee, part Greek. Are you saying she has a No, not at all. She's very, very strong. <laughs> for some reason, I had a flashback to Great Part. I was thinking of the clans. You know, the oh, clans yeah. were very strict about the. Uh, that too. My mom's maiden name is Wallace. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and actually, we're related. We're related. Well, we're, we're related. Uh, now, I'm sure we're related a lot closer. But we're related to our 23rd great grandfathers, uh, Robert the Bruce. Both of them, yeah. Yeah, Nelson Brenda's doing the genealogy of the church. She's finding all kinds of linkages that you just wouldn't imagine. It's amazing. There, there's four people on the Mayflower who are by a descendant of, mm -hmm. and it turns out they are, they are right now. Those four people have close to two million Americans. Right. I'm one of them. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. How, how small the world is. It is. You just, that was like, what, 14, 15 generations ago? Mm -hmm. I, I think you're, yeah. Yeah, it is really amazing. So, 
Well, let's let's go to the Lord in prayer and uh, remember. What are you reading next week? Genesis. Genesis. <laughs> <laughs> Revelation six. We're going to talk about the first seal. I know David won't be here, but it'll be on the. Uh, I'll post the the video yes. because next week we're talking about what what's the the, the white horse, the rider on the white horse, the Antichrist. Next week is the Antichrist. Yay! Fun times. Good times. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're just so thankful for this time that we can spend together and worship you and, and learn about you. And, and we just marvel at your word and how intricate it is, Father. And it's amazing that uh, you have these, uh, these great treasures, Father, just found in something that we all can hold. So, Father, as we go out this week, Lord, I pray that we would just remember you. And we would uh, live as a testimony of your love and your grace and your mercy. And again, Father, we pray for this Bulgaria team. We ask that you would just, just uh, pave the way for me, Father. And I pray for Andrew's test, Lord. And, and I pray for learning there, Lord, that, uh, that he can use. And uh, that you would just speak to him through that. And as he studies your word uh, for school, Lord, and just reveal new things to him. So, Father, we give you praise. And we give you thanks. In Christ's name.